back in 1984, after being in the United States for about eight years, we came here in 77, I became, we became qualified to become United States citizen. And so I went through uh, April of 84 through that ceremony. And thus I fulfilled the boyhood dream. Now those of you in this church, I'm not sure about the ones who are watching around the world, but I know that in this church, you know how much I love this country. How much I admire and respect the ingenuity that God gave to the founding fathers to create this experiment that has been nothing like it before. How much I'm grateful for those who literally gave their lives so that we have the freedoms that we enjoy today. You know all of that. And yet I am here to testify to you that my American citizenship, valuable as it is, does not hold a candle to the joy, the excitement, and the elation of my citizenship in heaven. The one thing that those who love Jesus must always, always, always remind themselves and literally every waking moment, not just on occasions, every waking moment, that this planet is not our home, that we are eagerly awaiting the coming of our beloved Savior to take us out of here. Now, atheists and those whom I call practical atheists that are in churches. There are many practical atheists because their lives are not different than the atheists. They call this escapism. I call it reality. <laughs> Why? Because it is only when we are constantly reminding ourselves of our eternal future, of our eternal home, can we truly experience joy in the midst of this sad and miserable world. You know how kids get excited when they're going to what their favorite place, when you tell them you're gonna take them on a trip that they really want to go to, and now how they get excited, and how they, 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 they can get excited days in advance, sometimes weeks in advance, months in advance, they cannot wait to get there. Now that, we, the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, could, should be like those kids in our excitement, in our going home to our future home. Listen to me, please. Keeping heaven at the forefront of our minds has huge benefits in this life. I'm going to show you in a minute. In fact, I was trying to narrow those benefits. There's so many. I had to narrow them down to 10. Okay, so you're not going to get three points. You're going to get 10 points. And then I'm going to give you an award for patience. <laughs> Ten benefits that heaven gives every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ here and now. Every born again believer, every lover of Jesus, every redeemed child of God, everyone who's constantly investing in heaven, knowing that that's their eternal home, should know of this priceless treasure that we have here on earth. According to Ephesians 2, 7, this treasure, this priceless tre treasure, that is the, the, a treasure that value cannot be comprehended, is called the riches of His grace. The riches of His grace. So I want to look at those 10 benefits very quickly. And if you do me a favor, do yourself a favor, Open your Bible into Ephesians chapter 2, because just about all of those 10 benefits are coming from Ephesians chapter 2. Maybe somebody can tell me what page it is in the Pew Bible if you don't have your own Bible. Pa 18, 18, 18, 19, somewhere there. <laughs> Keep it open in front of you. Benefit number one is that it's constant reminder, what constantly reminding ourselves of heaven, our future home, is our resurrection from sin and death. 
We already rose from sin and death. Ephesians 2, look at it with me. You were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. But God, can you say that with me? Say it again. Who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. Now, beloved, listen to me. This is the foundational truth of the Christian faith. This is the foundational truth of the Christian faith. And it is diametrically opposed to the biggest lie that has ever been invented and manufactured by Satan that has sold a bill of goods to millions of people around the world. What is it? That if you are a good person, you go to heaven. That is the biggest lie from the pit of hell that is invented, manufactured, and sold by the devil. I find this permeates all religions, by the way, as I travel the globe. But it is antithetical to the Christian faith. Here is the absolute truth straight from the Word of God. In heaven, there is only one good person. In heaven, there's only one good person. It's Jesus. Everybody else in heaven is a bad person who's redeemed by grace. Can I get an amen? Before repenting of our sin and receiving Christ as our Savior and Lord, we, will not, we were not, listen to me, we were not sick or weak or on life support. No, we were dead. We were what? Dead, dead, dead. dead. (laughs) In our natural state before we came to Christ, before we became born again, we were spiritually dead. None of us could really have looked in the mirror and says, oh, here goes a good person. (laughs) I don't know if I can do that now, (laughs) even after Christ redeemed me. And the only reason I'm going to make it to heaven is the righteousness of Jesus, not mine. Now, no one can truly, honestly, unless they're deceived, can look in the mirror and says, I deserve heaven. Hear me right. The person who's listening to me right now, whether it will be here in this sanctuary or the many, many people watching, hundreds of thousands watching around the world, the person who's listening to me right now and watching who have never committed the life to Jesus Christ, who have never been born again, who have never received Jesus as their only Savior and Lord, most likely they have their hackles rising right now. And I thank God for that. You might be saying, what do you mean I'm dead? (laughs) What do you mean? I'm not dead, I'm vigorous, I'm alive. That's absurd to say that I am dead. Yes, you're physically alive, but you're spiritually dead until you come to Jesus. Until you surrender your life to him, repent of your sins. You know, in Luke chapter 15, very familiar passage to most Christians, even some non-Christians know it, the story of the prodigal son. Every of us, a lot of people know it, even if they don't know the details, they don't understand it. The father of the prodigal said of his son, when he departed from home and went to the far country and he came back in repentance, he said, this son of mine was dead. Now he's alive. Was he physically dead? No, spiritually dead until he repented and came back to the father. I heard people actually say, I've worked for everything I got. I'm going to earn my way to heaven. Please listen, please listen, please listen. I like hard work as anybody. I work hard, I love working hard. I told a friend of mine from Iowa who is visiting me this week, I said, I cannot wait to wake up in the morning (laughs) to get going for serving God. But hard work will never get anyone to heaven. (laughs) So for believers, the first benefit of focusing on heaven is that we constantly reminded that we have been raised from sin and death. 
Second benefit, God's mercy and love. Because we are born in sin, and then when we grow up, we adopted sinful behavior. Because the root of the tree is sinful. <laughs> Therefore, the fruit showed up as sinful behavior. And that is offending to a holy God. And that is why Ephesians chapter 2 again says, but God. But who? God. Rich in mercy. <laughs> you know, I'm fond of a story that of a French mother who went to Emperor Bonaparte and she pleaded with him to pardon her son and give him reprieve. And Napoleon rejected her plea saying, this young man committed crime not once but twice. The law of France and the notion of justice demands that he put to death, be put to death. And the mother said to him, your majesty, I am not asking for justice. I'm pleading for mercy for my son. Bonaparte said, he said, your son does not deserve mercy. And the wise mother responded, if he deserved pardon, <laughs> it wouldn't have been mercy. <laughs> and mercy is what I'm asking for. Moved by her plea, Bonaparte showed mercy and spared the life of the young man. This mother taught the emperor a very important message of mercy. Listen to me. We all deserve justice. We all deserve hell. But God, but who? God. In his great love for us, showed us mercy to every repentant sinner. And so mercy and love of God, the second benefit of heaven. The third benefit is meaningful life. Meaningful life. God does not only give the believer new life, but he gives us meaningful, he gives us a life that is worth living. His love and mercy saved us not to be lazy or idle, no, but he saved us to good work. Look at Ephesians again. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. Beloved, please listen. Serving God and serving others and sharing the good news with whomever would listen to us, all are meaningful work. I know there's a, a phrase that we often use uh, and we often say it to people and say, get a life. Have you ever said that? Get a life. Meaning, stop being annoying and go and do something worthwhile. Do something productive with your life. Do something responsible with your life. Now I hear these days there's some people, 20 something are bunking in their parents' basement playing um, uh, uh, computer games, uh, playing video games. Get a life, get a life. It is when all of us believers who were dead in sin and trespasses do not have a life, do not have a spiritual life, when Christ came into our lives, is that we need to exhort one another, get a life. When those who are born again, God gave them a third wonderful benefit of heaven. He gave them meaningful life. The fourth benefit of heaven is a purpose for living. This one builds on the other. Purpose for living. God has given us the greatest purpose for living that is possible. As our brother said, it can't get better than that. It can't get better than that. Ephesians 2, 6 and 7 said, God raised us up with Christ and seated us where? In heaven. Where? Heaven. Why? In order that in the coming age he might show us the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. 
Now, beloved, please hear me right on this one. Please hear me right. When God saved us and he breathed on us and we became awakened from our dead and trespasses of sin, he gave us his spirit to dwell in us for a purpose, a new purpose, eternal and important purpose. Let me ask you a question. What is your purpose in life? Probably most people will answer this differently from one another. But as you go about your daily life, you should live in the full awareness of God's purpose for you. At your work, in your neighborhood, on campuses, uh, wherever you are, in the forefront of your mind must always be the greatest purpose that God has given you for living. You are representing heaven. That is the greatest purpose anyone can have. You are representing heaven. You are walking billboard advertising God's amazing grace. You are an ambassador of the King of Kings. Why? Because of where you are seated right now. Where are you seated right now? Are you sitting in the sanctuary here? No, you might be in a prison cell, or you might be in a hotel room, you might be in the living room, wherever you are, just look around where you're seated. Where are you seated? Where are you seated right now? Wherever you're watching from. That's not where you're seated. <laughs> you're actually seated in the heavenly realm right now. Yes, 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 you are on earth. Yes, you are going about your daily business. Yes, you are going to work every day. Yes, you're taking care of your family and wonderful as that might be. But at the same time, you are seated in the heavenly realms. Think about this. It's not a cutting of you like they do sometimes in the fake movies and fill a stadium with sort of cutting uh, cardboard thing. No, no, no. You actually sitting in heaven right now. <laughs> One of the greatest benefits of heaven is that you have a heavenly purpose. Amen. And now, right now, today, you have that heavenly purpose. Fifth benefit of heaven. You're having a fulfilling work. Oh my goodness, I heard how many people through the years not fulfilled at their work, not happy at their work. They don't feel really fulfilled in it and contented in it. But God created you with fulfilling work. All of the good works before you came to Christ. All of the good works that people do who do not know Christ. All of it. When God looks at it, it looks like a filthy rag. Can you believe that? Yes. Good. <laughs> In God's eye, that's, that work is nothing. It's, it's even worse than nothing. Uh, but the work that you do after you repented, after you become born again, after you surrendered your life to Christ, the work that God gives you that you are doing right now, Looks wonderful to God. Jesus. Just like when he created the world, he said, he was satisfied. He said, it's good. God smiling from heaven when you're doing his work that he purposed for you to, to have. Why? Because that work the, is, the, is the work that he gave you to do. It's a service that he called you to do. It is the task that he entrusted you to do. It is the calling that he placed on your life. Even though the work that God gives us is often for serving others, often is for the benefit of others, and yet it brings us a sense of joy and satisfaction like no other. You know, sometimes when people ask me to pray with them, and I said, I hate to impose on you. I said, do you understand? It is a privilege it's a privilege. I'm doing the work that God gives, and that is satisfying for me to pray for somebody else and to see somebody else blessed. Someone said, what's in it for you? I said, that is the greatest joy I can have. <laughs> Hear me right, please. 
There is no unemployment line in the kingdom of Jesus. If you are saved, if you are a child of God, then he has a fulfilling, enriching job, work for you to do. Most believers have multiple spiritual gifts. At least you have one, but in, in most cases, multiple gifts. And that is why in this church, with all of our new members, we give them a, a self-administered test. If they did not know, most of them do, but if they didn't, or confirm what they know, that what their spiritual gifts are, so they can use them boldly and courageously. Sometimes I try to imagine the broken heart of God when he watches one of his children spending day after day after day self-serving and not pursuing the work that God has given him to do. Start now. Start now. It's never too late. As long as you're breathing, it's never too late. Number six, the sixth benefit of heaven is our heavenly citizenship. I alluded to this, but I'm going to expand it here. Our heavenly citizenship. Beloved, earth is our temporary home. It's our temporary home. Heaven is our permanent home. And that is why Paul in Philippians 3.20 could say, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await the Savior from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Through the years, I have had the great joy and really pleasure and, 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 and honor in many ways to know ambassadors to this country from other countries, uh, diplomats. Uh, in fact, one or two of them are very close friend, friends of mine. And I got close to some of them and we talk and one day I was talking to this particular ambassador who's been in this country for many years and I know he, he loves America but, but he's an ambassador of a foreign country and, but one day I got so carried away. Well, you know sometimes I get carried away, right? You know that? I'm always carried away anyway so it doesn't matter. I was getting carried away and I'm talking about America and America and America and I'm, I'm talking and he's been here for so long and I, I forgot that he is not an American and, and he just gently and softly looked at me and he said, Michael, I'm not an American. <laughs> he just dawned on me. <laughs> he's representing his country in America or to America. It dawned on me. That moment was a great moment of revelation for me. No matter how long you live, he lived in America. No matter how deeply he's entrenched in the American culture, no matter how much his kids are going to American schools and Americanized in every way, his citizenship is in his home country, not here. Oh, beloved, listen to me, please, in a far, 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 far greater way. No matter how long we live here, no matter how deeply we get entrenched in this world, this is not our home country. We represent another country. As citizens of heaven, we are to adopt the culture of heaven, the values of heaven, and the practices of heaven. And all of this should be in contrast to this corrupt and evil dying world. This world is obsessed with endless entertainment, acquiring wealth and status and financial security. But our focus is on eternal things and storing up treasures in heaven where we are seated. Please listen carefully. Listen carefully. If you see yourself this way, if you talk, self-talk, we all self-talk. If you self-talk this way, every day, every waking moment, I'll make you a promise, it will revolutionize your life. I'll make it a promise. I know of what I'm talking about. From the first early hours in the morning when you wake up praising and praying and blessing God to the time you 
you drift away to sleep thankfully for the end of the day, you are on top of the world. No matter how messy this world becomes, no matter how corrupt this world becomes, no matter how dreadful things appear. Can I get an amen? amen? Try it. Seven. We have a heavenly ID card. Not only a citizenship, but we have a card. Do you have a card? Do you have one? Hello? Do you have one? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. In Christ Jesus, you once, can you say once? once. Were far away. Have been brought by the blood of Christ. Question, what does your ID card say? Mine says the blood of Jesus Christ. Are you carrying an ID card? Are you using that ID card? I think everybody has an ID. You know, the one thing about the ID card that works here in this country, but when you go overseas, you have to have a passport. But that's your ID card too. You cannot go into a foreign land without that passport. And your passport is your ID card as you travel overseas. Beloved, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. As citizens of heaven, your ID card stamped with the indelible blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross for you. The moment you come to Christ in confession, repentance, brokenness, humility, and receive that ID card, you have that ID card stamped with the blood of Jesus. Now, if you're listening to me, wherever you are, if you think that you can go to heaven with some other ID card, let me tell you, it is a fake ID card. Other than the blood of Jesus Christ, every ID card is fake. Make sure that your ID card is genuine, not fake. Can I get an amen? amen. Not only that your ID card will take us to heaven, but also in this life, that ID card is going to give you victory over sin by the blood of Jesus. It's going to give you victory over discouragement by the blood of Jesus. will give you victory over temptation by the blood of Jesus. will give you victory over the opposition by the blood of Jesus. Here and now. Number eight. The eighth benefit of daily focusing on heaven is a refuge of peace. Verses 14 and 15. For he himself is our peace who made of the two groups and he destroyed the barriers, the dividing wall of hostility. How? By setting aside in his flesh the law with the commandments and regulations. Hear me right, please, please, please. Christ's purpose was to create one humanity out of the two, the Jews and the Gentiles. There was a wall of hostility, the Jews and Gentiles. Now that wall has been broken. In the old Herodian temple, those of you who traveled to Israel, you saw, you know, this huge stones, just as Jesus said, not one stone will be on top of the other in, in Israel. The Herodian, that's the Herodian temple. In the Herodian temple, before it was destroyed, as Jesus prophesied in 70 AD by the Romans, there was a sign, big sign, right there in the temple. A warning sign written in Greek letters, believe it or not, not in, in Hebrew or, or, or Aramaic, but in Greek. And it was engraved in the wall and then painted with red. You can't miss it. Here's how it reads. No foreigner, meaning Gentiles, is to enter within the balustrade and embankment around the sanctuary. Whoever is caught 
will have himself to blame for his death, which follows. This is serious stuff. Are you with me? This is serious stuff. Josephus, the Jewish historian, and Philo said um, that in order to keep the Jewish population happy, the Romans gave the Sanhedrin one case in which they can exercise the death penalty. You remember how they couldn't kill Jesus? They could not kill him because they did not have the authority because Jesus' guilt was blasphemy. He said, the Father and I are one, that he's the Son of God. And they wanted to finish him off, but they couldn't do it. So they had to go and trick the Romans to do it for them because only the Romans have authority to exercise capital punishment. But the Romans gave the Sanhedrin authority to exercise capital punishment for this one only thing, and that is if a Gentile wanders off into the temple. Think about this. You know, I don't know about you. You know, you know I, I pour my heart out to you and I tell you this. But when I'm thinking about this and, and the prejudice and all that stuff, I, I cannot help it, but I grieve over the merchants of racism in this country. They're merchants. They fake racism in order to make money and they enrich themselves. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. This manufactured racism is that. It's manufactured. It's not real. Listen to me. When you experience racial, racial, racial strife, political strife, or marital strife at home. That is all direct result of sin and Satan ruling supreme instead of Jesus. Conflict will raise its ugly head when sin enters in and takes the place of Christ. But when Christ reigns supreme, there is always peace, whether it be in the home or in the nation, can I get an amen? amen? Under Christ's rule, all hatred, all prejudice, all revenge, all strife will cease. Jesus is our peace, and we can have no peace without him. We kick God out, God says, fine. I watch how you're going to operate, and we're in a mess. We're in a mess. We need to cry, God, come back. Come back to our country. Come back to our nation. Come back to our homes. Come back to our churches. Jesus is our peace. And we can have no peace without him. Number nine, the benefit, number nine, is having a new loving family. A new loving family. When Jesus became our peace, he abolished the enmity between us and God the Father. And he abolished the enmity between us and each other. Regardless of our differences in terms of race or language or economic status or any of the superficial differences that we may have, Jesus can unite us in peace. Why? Because his purpose was to form a one heavenly family, the family of God, where God the Father is our Father. He's our daddy. Jesus is our older brother and redeemer. And we are each other's brothers and sisters. This is the truest brotherhood, sisterhood that there is. Not all the fake ones. Why? Because do you know that you have a heavenly blood flowing through your veins? Once you come to Jesus, that, that heavenly blood starts flowing through your veins. We're a family. That is a family in the truest sense of the word. And that is why Jesus said in Matthew 18, 15, he said, when your brother sin against you, go to him or her 
one-on-one. -on -one. Go to him privately. Don't go all over the place talking about them, but go to them. Go to them, talk to them. Why? Because Jesus wants us to talk and speak to each other in this loving, peacemaking way. We're a family. We're his family. And when Jesus truly presides over his family, there will be peace. There will be peace. Say that with me. There will be peace. Oh, but listen, that doesn't mean we're not going to have disagreements. Oh, my goodness. I mean, there's not two people together who will have a disagreement. Of course. Absolutely. We can disagree. That's not the issue. That's not what we're talking about. But we'll always have peace with one another. Why? Because, listen to me, this is a dress rehearsal for heaven. And if you're not getting ready for heaven, you're going to be in a world of hurt. This is a dress rehearsal for living together for our eternal home. Number 10 and finally, these are the perfect 10. Perfect 10. We have a new home. A new home. Look at verses 20 to 22. The household of faith built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So you can't ditch or get unhitched from the Old Testament. That is, you're destroying part of the foundation. Are you with me? Yes. You're getting it? Yes. Do I need to elaborate? No. Thank you. <laughs> the household of faith built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building joined together and rises and become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too being built together and became dwelling. <laughs> Listen to this. You become dwelling in which God lives by his Holy Spirit. Heaven is our home. But we are also home. We are a home. You're a home. You're a, we are, we're a home. We're a dwelling place in which God himself resides. Now, beloved, sometimes that mind boggles. It boggles my mind when I focus on this. God is dwelling in me. The foundation of his house made up the Old Testament and New Testament. Jesus himself, the cornerstone. Now, in ancient times, not like we build houses and high-rise buildings now, you know, cement and a lot of um, foundation and so forth. No, a house in the ancient times basically built around a cornerstone. You get a big boulder and you put it on the corner and that becomes the foundation of the house. It's the source of strength. It's the source of its stability. <laughs> the walls and the roof of that dwelling rests firmly upon that cornerstone and everything in the house built in relationship to the cornerstone, which is the Lord Jesus. Let me tell you this as I conclude. I'm pleading with you now. I'm pleading with you. If you missed everything I said, I pray to God you didn't. But, but if you have, don't miss what I'm going to tell you. Don't miss what I'm going to tell you. Don't miss what I'm going to tell you right now. Like many people before me, immigrants who came to this country and became naturalized citizens. The naturalized citizens, once they become naturalized, they are free to enjoy all of the blessings of citizenship that the natural born citizens have. Except for one very, very, very important difference. One very important difference between the natural born and the naturalized citizens. I pray to God that this will leave an indelible mark in all of our minds today. One problem that a naturalized citizen can have that the other citizen cannot 
It's when he goes home to the country of his birth. The country of his birth does not acknowledge his citizenship of another country. When you go to the land of the birth, they treat you as a citizen of their country. All privileges are gone. Especially if that land of birth is in hostility or hostile to the United States. An Iranian-born American citizen by the name of Namzi suffered untold torture when he returned back to his country of birth, Iran. In October 2015, he was arrested in Iran, thrown into notorious Ivan prison and was tortured because he was a naturalized citizen of the United States. He was falsely accused of collaborating with the enemy. Oh, beloved, please listen to me. All of you who are citizens of heaven, raise your hand. All of you citizens, raise your hand. Even if you're watching, raise your hand. I want to speak to you, every one of you who are citizens of heaven. There is a profound parallel here between Mr. Namzi's plight who's imprisoned in the land of his birth and the plight of every citizen of heaven who returns to his or her country of birth. Their estate before Christ. When Satan dominated and ruled. When sin ruled supreme in our lives before we come to Christ. Listen carefully. When a citizen of heaven deliberately returns to his former state of sin and rebellion and carnality and disobedience. You are returning to Satan's territory from which Jesus saved you. By deliberately returning to Satan's territory, you have removed yourself from the protection and the protective environment of your heavenly citizenship. I'm not saying that you lose your salvation. And I'm not even saying you lose your heavenly citizenship. But you bring upon yourself untold pain and suffering. Of course, depending whether we have a good government in Washington or not, often when we do have a good government, they'll go and fend for for that citizen who's arrested in his home country try to help him come out. Others just say, we can't do anything about it. Exercise strategic patience, they say. In the same way, listen to me please, in the same way, God will rescue, rescue you. God will deliver you. God will call you back. But you have to come out of that land back to your citizenship land. Right now, there are somebody, Lord impressed on me so strongly in the early hours of this morning. Somebody who's listening to me right now, right now, this very moment, who is wandering off into the wilderness of sin and carnality and disobedience and rebellion against God's word. Somebody knows and you know who you are. There may be pastors who are watching this very message who know deep down they have wandered away from the infallible word of God and begin to preach their ideas. Come back, come back. Save yourself all of the agony and the suffering of putting yourself under Satan's control. God is calling you. God has been calling you. Now it's the time to come back. Time to come back. Will you stand up with me? Time to come back. Say it with me. Time to come back. back. Precious Father, for that person who have deceived themselves, that they cannot overcome sin. 
call them back to repentance, to come back to you, the heavenly father, the loving God. For all of us, Lord, we pray this morning, renew us as we come in confession to approach your holy table. Cleanse our hearts with a spirit of, rebe- spirit of repentance and faith. Oh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.